What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of My Other Passion. I'm Ernest Baker, Editor-in-Chief of Front Office Sports, and today we have an amazing guest, Johanna Ferries. She's a GM and SVP of Call of Duty at Activision Blizzard. So basically, she is in control of the most popular video game franchise in the world. In just a couple days here, we have Modern Warfare 2 coming out. That game is going to be massive. It's going to drive billions of dollars in revenue. And really, it's going to have the whole fourth quarter on lock when you talk about the video game industry. We had an amazing conversation with Johanna. It's filled with gems. She's talking about esports. She's talking about strategy. She's talking about her own career, going from Harvard to NFL, Call of Duty. I'm not going to keep you waiting. Let's go ahead and hear from our partners at Oracle NetSuite real quick, and then we'll be right back. 2000, 2008, even 2022, when it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. First, you got the dot-com crash and the housing crash and the roller coaster that we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it is a dangerous time to not know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses don't really have that problem. Instead, they have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, everything you need to manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve those margins. So when there's uncertain times, remember the answer is NetSuite. You can identify rising costs, automate business processes, easily see where to save money. And that's why 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgrade it to NetSuite. So what are you waiting for? Right now, you're in luck because NetSuite is offering a special one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. All you have to do is head to netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. Once again, netsuite.com slash myotherpassion. I promise you, it will take your business to the next level. Johanna, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Where are you? Uh, where are you coming from? Based in LA, so uh, all all focused on Modern Warfare Two. It's a big big week for us coming up here. It definitely is. Uh, we're in the same city, so you know I know what that West Coast life is like. Now I, I lived in New York for a long time. Grew up in Chicago. Nice. Um, yeah, and, I was um, I was like 14 years in New York, so that's also sort of home for me. Okay, so I did it like a decade. We talk about it like it's like, but but I, I I'm curious. Um, you know what's like the transition been like for you? Do you feel like do you feel like this is home and you're set here, or you feel like mm, maybe I'll go back? Like I always love having this East Coast West Coast combo. I know. I think the bi coastal life is where it's at. To be totally honest, they have so many strengths, right? Um, right. But it's going on four years. It'll actually be four years this month that we've been out here in the South Bay of LA and two young kids love Cali life. So from that perspective, you know, the the quality of life is is hard to beat out here. But I do miss myself some Manhattan and Brooklyn, I'm not gonna lie. So we'll see. Yeah, I know. I try try to get back a few times a year. I, I, I'm in the same position, have the kids, and it's like, yeah, when they can go ride bikes outside in December, it's exactly. it's hard to beat that. Nice. Well, uh, like you said, it's a huge week for you. Um, Modern Warfare 2, Call of Duty, it is coming out um, in a couple days. And I have to say, as someone who's followed the franchise, um, you know, I love Cold War, love World War II, nice. Vanguard. But, but you know, Modern Warfare has got like a little bit of a different clout in the franchise. Mm-hmm. What What is it like, you know, bringing such like, a storied installment of Call of Duty, you know, back to the masses, you know, evolution of the series. It's it's a new generation. We have the capabilities of PS5, Xbox Series X. Just like, what is it like over there at Activision Blizzard right now? You said it. I mean, Modern Warfare as a sub franchise within the Call of Duty universe is its own mega brand, I'd argue, right? So it's just been such a blessing, so awesome to take this, you know, sequel to what was the biggest selling, uh, you know, part of our franchise three years ago with Modern Warfare in 2019. And now to see the step change innovation that's going to pour into this, it's such a big moment, but you're riding on the wave of a lot of pent up fandom, a lot of built up demand. Uh, I think our community is just so hype for what Infinity Ward and all of our partner studios all over the world have done with Modern Warfare 2. And on the backs of that, you know, in mid-November next month, here comes a full reset of the Warzone experience with Warzone 2.0. You got Warzone going to mobile. I mean, we can cover it all, but it's it's even bigger, I'd argue, than just the next few days 
I often think of Modern Warfare 2 as the door that's opening to this whole new future for the franchise that's much more long term. So can you um, expand on that a little bit? Like, you know, this series, there's an installment pretty much, if not like every year, um, it's become a part of the culture. I think it's even like bigger than video games, right? This is like pop culture at right. this point, uh, you know, doing numbers that outdo the box office. Like That's I remember right. Call, of Duty, Call of Duty was one of those things where the tide started to turn. It was like video games make more than movies now. And I would, you know, between Call of Duty, Halo, GTA, there was a few where it was like, this is serious business. And um, with all of that precedent, with all of the hype and the pressure with the game coming out, like what do you hope to communicate um, about Call of Duty, about these specific titles? It's like, yes, we know it's popular. We know everyone loves Call of Duty. But when you're in the driver's seat as GM, senior vice president, you know, overseeing like the execution of this rollout, what do you want to stick in people's minds? Such a great, great question. And part of the answer, I think, was built into your question, right? Like there's the reframe of gaming becoming just the modern medium of entertainment and how people gather, how people build so social connections, how people build friendships across global regions of the world in real time. But you also have outside of traditional gameplay, which is obviously the heart and soul of what we do here. You've got all these ancillary ways to be a fan of Call of Duty or be a part of the community of Call of Duty now, where you can gather around and watch the Call of Duty League on a Sunday with your friends or go into the arena and have an, you know, an in-person experience, not dissimilar to what an NFL or NBA fan might be able to do, and you're simply watching and rooting for your favorite city and team, right? You can drop in and play Battle Royale with coworkers after a crazy day at work and just unwind and escape. And it has nothing to do with how you're ranking up or how good you may or may not be at the game in terms of some of our core elite players. And you can also just rock the gear. I mean, I've got probably more Call of Duty gear that I'm just wearing out about town because it's just a part of my lifestyle now from a consumer products and licensing and designer collaborations. And I could go on and on and to your point, how it appears in film and how it's just starting to show up in all facets of how we as consumers interact with each other and ourselves. That's what I'm hoping to get out of it is that we start to change the conversation around not just Call of Duty as an entertainment platform, but as gaming as an industry and get out of the myths of yesteryear, where it was maybe perceived as a one type of archetype that was really into gaming, where now everybody's a gamer and everybody has a way to be able to interact with their favorite IP in a way that meets their preferences. What are the expectations from a business standpoint? Um, like you all, this, this drives billions of dollars in revenue, quite frankly. Um, it's something we report on coming from front office sports, being a business publication. And, you know, I think a lot of our listeners would be curious to understand uh, beyond that, that larger concept. What does this mean on paper? What does the company hope it does for this quarter, for this next fiscal year? Um, you know, in your position, how much of it is, uh, is driven by, okay, let's, let's create revenue driving experiences um, among all the fun that everyone's having, but just what, what role does that play in it? Cause it's such, it's such a big game, you know? So obviously that's a part of it. It is. And I often say it's core bread and butter call of duty. It's a hallmark of the brand that we come out swinging big every Q4 typically with that premium experience. And of course, in a couple of days here, that new experience is Modern Warfare 2. But our fans for almost two decades now have come to expect from Activision that we're gonna publish this amazing swath of content um, and build on that now with live seasons and just how you know uh, Warzone and other things have opened the funnel for live operations throughout the year. The reason I say that is because you're exactly right. It's this combination of great creative innovation. The product needs to sing, period. But my role and my team is 24 seven focused on how do you package that up to make it palatable? How do you market that in a way that excites people or wins people back who maybe have 
left the franchise for some time, or to your point, they loved World War II, but they fell off. How do we reposition it to get their, you know, interaction back, their engagement back? Because it does drive the business. And as much as gaming is entertainment and as much as gaming is creative, it's also a huge industry with a lot of revenue riding on it and ancillary revenue riding on in terms of partnerships. So that's the job, you know, and, and I love that. I love that hybrid. I came from the NFL. It was no different there. It was, you know, the beauty of the sport and the magic of just watching what can happen on the field, but it's also a huge business. It's a huge industry. And I love um, kind of roles that straddle the two. So some of the numbers uh, that are out there and all these accolades, number one selling console game and franchise for like, you know, 14 years in a row, $30 billion in revenue. I was kind of blown away seeing, you know, you're approaching like half a billion units sold. Um, what is it like 400 something million? Um, can you tell us um, anything about those numbers? Like just what what does that mean to you to be in charge of a franchise that has driven $30 billion, that has half a billion people playing and, and units being sold. Um, I, I'd love to hear like your perspective on how that happens. Yeah, anecdotally, I, I actually I'll kind of storytell around it because I think sometimes that lands better. I remember when I was even thinking about taking the jump into gaming and esports and leaving traditional sports and media. And at first I was falling into the same traps that I think a lot of people do, not thinking it was as big as it is, not thinking it's as growth uh, inclined as it is, especially as you think three, five, 10 years out from, from now. And I was judging it solely based on certain, you know, uh, myths or um, just undermining how big this industry really is and how big, you know, um, Activision's role is within it. When I got out the calculator, though, and I kind of <laughs> stopped telling myself what, what to think, and you start just running the pure numbers. And it's not just Call of Duty. I mean, you can think about what Epic's doing and Fortnite, how that's completely revolutionized the game and the industry, what League of Legends is doing, especially on the esports side, and how many hundreds of thousands and millions of people are filling bowls all over the world to go see the most elite League of Legends champions play. And there's so many more examples. When you start to quantify it the way that you said, people take a step back and they say, I'm sorry, was that was that a billion you said or a billion? And you really start to see how people's eyes get wider. I, I think we've made some step change advancements in in um, busting those myths and those misperceptions, right, um, as an industry over the last even four or five years that I've been a part of it. But I try to talk about that. You know, I think as well about back to Call of Duty, you've got more than 300 million people who have an active relationship with the game um, and how mobile in particular and free to play really widen our funnel of engagement and built even a bigger audience in the last three years than we have ever had. It invites such opportunity. It also invites a lot of new expectations. Um, but the dynamism of that is uh, a blessing. You know, it's, it's really just about how do you curate a calendar and how do you deliver the best quality experiences? And it's predicated on also hiring the best possible talent. You know, we can't get it done without great people. I know that's right. Um, a lot of it is about about the team around you. And I and I saw you've had, um, you know, some some great accolades, industry awards that have come your way. And I, I think you've, from what I've seen out there, always done a great job of, you know, giving that credit to the team too. Um, which I, you know, just as someone who's in a different type of business, but in business too, uh, you know, this podcast or all the stuff that we write and produce on front office sports, it doesn't happen without a collective. Um, but I did read a little bit about like your history as a gamer, um, you know, not, I think not the best. Have you, has your, has your call of duty skills stepped up? Are you, are you on there with like crazy kill streaks now or, or, or what? How's that going? I, I can, I could probably count on one hand how many times I've gotten a, a nice kill streak in a match, but it's funny, you know, I've always been a casual call of duty player. And it's, it's also funny because I often say like, that's okay by me. One, I don't have enough time to like grind and get much better. But two, I love it. Whenever I drop in, I'm here to like camp. I'm here to have somebody carry me. Uh, it's, it is going back to that escape. It's going back to that time to just have fun. 
And when you have so many different ways to play, so many different playlists you can drop into, the the buffet, if you will, the menu for Call of Duty is so rich. Uh, that's why I'm honestly I'm so excited that we opened the doors for the first time to early campaign access. You know, start people started pouring in yesterday for those who had pre-purchased Modern Warfare 2. We had never done that You already that know I'm on that. Good. Like, you already know I'm on that vault edition. Let's yes. go. <laughs> yes, exactly. So be my... Yeah, please. Keep going, for sure. Well, all I was going to say is that that's, that's going to be all my free time until I can hop online. Exactly. Exactly right. And that was born out of those insights, right? Like, for multiplayer players they don't want to have to wait for their campaign or single player buddies to finish right and so there's a lot of insights as to why we did that and it's just so cool the reason i say that is i'm i love playing campaign mainly because i feel you know a little bit better as a call of duty player you play at my own pace not getting fried the second i, I drop into also the map. i'm like a i'm like a historical like war documentary you guys so like so literally like world war ii and and being able to do d-day and you know all this stuff like immersive like totally. I, I i'd say for a few of them where it, it covers a historical period that i have an affinity for i was a bit more of a campaign player and that's really yep. world war ii and cold war recently yep yep it totally makes sense um so yeah my skills have gotten better because i play more in the job than i did probably five or six years ago but um even back in the day you know when it was still emerging in the mid 2000s late 2000s I was that person that likes to sit on the couch and watch friends who are really good play. So I actually loved as a viewer watching others and just getting together that way, which translates, I think, well into the esports vector, right? I believe in the ability to also gather around and watch greatness perform at the greatest levels. Um, again, not dissimilar to how traditional sports fans fill the bowls to watch the best and most elite athletes play that sport. So I think there's a, there's a transference there um, that I really enjoy. And and business, you're not going to put up the type of numbers you all put up with just the hardcore gamers. Like, you know, it's really important to just capture a wide audience imagination. And, you know, if it's someone who gets to hop on for an hour on the weekend or someone who's sweating every night on their 12 hours straight, I mean, you got to appeal to everybody. Exactly. Um, but I've... Uh, what you're talking about with esports and with watching, you know, growing up, I think our era, I heard you talking about Super Mario Bros and Nintendo and even Oregon Trail, which, you know, yes. all classics. Yes. Um, it, I was on my Sega Genesis. Like, that's all the stuff that brought me in. But even well before online, like, it was always fun to sit there and watch your friend or your sibling or something and try to beat Sonic or try exactly. to get through Mario. Um and I've I remember when streaming started to hit and I was mm -hmm. like, for some reason, there was still a disconnect for me. And I was like, OK, why are we sitting around watching? Like, who wants to watch mm. uh, one? I have changed that over the past few years just out of like like I'm big. It also Activision Blizzard. I'm a big Overwatch guy. It's probably right. like. The, like the best the game on the best that i went crazy on overwatch 2 the other day had Love like it. 25 kills like that's that i need to be in an esports league um <laughs> not really i would get destroyed but <laughs> but you know i do have fun with it and so I, i'll hop on and watch people to learn how to use agent um what is it 76 mm -hmm. like that's my guy at least and, and learn how to like you know what are the metas how can i really like understand how to play this character better and i say like the youth like we both have kids. They love watching people play games yes. on YouTube. Like, like they love it so much. They love it more than Netflix, you know? Yes. And so I think, I think we're in a whole new space, but, but what does that part of it mean to you? And are you looking at the YouTube streaming communities, working with the Twitch streamers, obviously esports is really big. I know you, you reference League of Legends. It's like, they do Super Bowl viewership numbers, totally. like, That's exactly you know, right. globally, but, but still super crazy. Um, what, what do you think about, and how do you like cater to that part of the business? So much of it is predicated on buy the game, play it, whatever. But how do you try to like, keep that ecosystem like flourishing? Yeah, it's such a great question. And it's been such a big fo focal point for me um, since coming into the role, to be honest, because I'm a big believer in partnership with 
the lead voices in our community, even when that's hard or even when we may disagree. And trust me, we may disagree more often than we agree, but to keep the conversation and the feedback loop thriving, the word that I come back to a lot is proximity. And, you know, I kept asking ourselves on the team, how do we bring more proximity, more closeness in with streamers, influencers, content creators who care about this game? And they may be caring because they love it. They may care because they're not having the best experience we could possibly deliver for them. We need to learn and we need to be active listeners and so understanding that zeitgeist. We have seen such um, rewards and benefits from that body language and, and pivoting around, okay, let's stay in conversation. Let's bring them under the hood. Good tactical examples, starting to get even developers live on stream at times with our you know, influencers and our streamers to say, let's play together. And then you as a viewer can watch you know, that interaction while they're playing a new season of content. Another example, briefing or pre-briefing some of our key content creators before we launch a new season to say, hey, here's what you can expect. We wanna give you access before everybody else. Here are the things that we think are gonna be great. Here are the things we're maybe a little concerned about, would love your thoughts as well. But even that, again, proximity, that sense of information sharing, that transparency, that frequency of communication has just paid such dividends. Lastly, I'd say last last month was really a hallmark example of that with Call of Duty Next. We were you know, putting on a live broadcast event. It was really a hands-on experience for 200 plus streamers and content creators to come in live we hosted them to a VIP experience live on site to let them roll up their sleeves and have that initial hands-on experience with MP from Modern Warfare 2, Warzone 2.0, and a host of other things. And it just, it was such an incredible opportunity to say, we're in this together. The game is never perfect. And it's only as strong as our ability to continue to thought partner, right, around what great looks like. Uh, and I think that just was such an incredible way to drive adoption, drive awareness, drive anticipation among broader fan bases uh, within the Call of Duty community because they could see these big names feeling proximate again to the development process and to our process of marketing the game. So, so important to be in touch with your community in gaming. Like they will have you trending if they're not happy. Yes. And they will also do the same thing if they're in love with the exactly. product, you know, but they, they have a lot of power. So, um, you know, community management is real. And I, I, I worked at 2K uh, mm -hmm. prior to FOS and, you know, similar, mm -hmm. very, very engaged community and um, definitely understanding where you're coming from. What do you, what do you think is like, some of the shining examples of things that you've seen from the community, like like specific stuff that you're just like, wow, I understand the power of this franchise or, you know, there's so much I just think is really cool or interesting. I mean, like you're, you're in the trenches here. What are mm -hmm. some things that, that have really like wowed you? I think what's wowed me actually was when I first started and we were, we were creating the launch and preparing to launch the Call of Duty League and the esports community within Call of Duty, I mean, that's as core as you're going to get. I mean, you, you want trial by fire, you get involved right there, right? Because these are not only the best of the best from a player perspective, but to your point, they also hold so much weight within our content creation community and our influencer community. And they know so many moves before they're made kind of thing, right? And they're very vocal. Um, and they're great influencers themselves, but they're not going to hold back. And so why I say that is it felt like I was thrown into the deep end of the pool starting there. And I'm thankful every day that I started there, despite my own casual Call of Duty um, play style to manage and harness and work and learn from the scums and the hectors and the phases. And, you know, I could go on and on. And the legacy of passion that they had brought, they built up competitive Call of Duty before anyone in, in the mass industry was looking, right? These are the icons um, decades prior to, to me or others coming in and trying to say, how do we level that up and make it even more uh, mainstream? I say that because I was really floored and wowed by, again, as you um, spoke to, the ability to either do right or wrong by that community and how quickly they will take that 
to Twitter or to the interwebs and opine. And so an example of, you know, how, how do we take that and harness that enthusiasm for, for better results? Uh, when I started, it was clear, how do we bring in more upstream partnership with our pros and our GMs and our coaches to get an early read on map design, on, you know, modes and consistency and things that they're going to need year on year, season on season to be able to play this sport at the most elite level, but also the freshness of things that they're going to be open to um, and really designing together. Once we started to do that and worry less about leaks, worry less about um, withholding, right, um, the plans, I think we started to see more advocacy among our players and our pros and our esports conglomerates to market the league positively and to say, hey, we're on board for this. And together we've built, you know, real double digit growth year on year ever since. And I expect more. And it's still such a nascent league in many ways. It's only three years old, right? So that was, was I was really impressed and wowed by their receptivity to to getting on board, but we had to, again, open the kimono and, and really partner with them in a, in a different, more transparent way than we had ever done before. So when you're making, you know, all these efforts, you know, your time that you've been with Call of Duty, um, super focused on community, also focused on the growth, the revenue, it's all snowballing. It's all, you know, for one big goal. What is a success for the launch of let's say let's say right now just modern warfare too i know we have warzone we have mobile um but like a couple of days here you know the whole half the country and possibly the world is like going to be glued to their console or what have you um what success how many active users do you need in the first week or the first month to say I did my job, right? Mm. Well, I'm, you know, it's my duty to withhold from specific um, numbers, uh, just given the, the, the public nature of our company. But I will say, you know, we have massive, I mean, I want to say historic ambitions for what Modern Warfare 2 should be able to do. And I think what's really special about this moment is how much hype and anticipation and engagement we've already seen pouring in. When you then think about, okay, three weeks later, we come in with Warzone and a brand new Warzone experience on top, that, if we do our jobs well, should position us for some massive, massive wins for the franchise, right? And, and really inviting more engagement than we possibly have ever seen before. And, and that's the ambition. You know, we play really big. We play really big in Call of Duty. And it's part of the reason that the job and the role has such appeal because, um, you know, we set high marks for ourselves, but it's usually because we believe we can, uh, we can do it. And, and again, back to people, we hire the best and brightest to have the tenacity to, to shoot for the moon. So um, we're going to see, we're going to see, but I, I love the plan. Uh, this plan we've been working on for well over, you know, a year and a half now. I wouldn't change a thing. I think the team's just crushed it. And so results aside, I'm super proud of how we've rolled this out. And I'm super proud of how the team is working cross-functionally to get it done. Um, so let's check back in in December and see how we're doing. But I'm feeling good. Right. Not to mention that holiday rush. Right. Is is is, is probably sometimes a little, little bigger than, than launch. You know, launch is... right? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, it's a huge part of things for sure. That's why... Mm -hmm. You know, Jay-Z has that quote every fourth quarter. I like to Mike Jordan, but that's like Call of Duty in the video games. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so so talking about like your role more specifically, I, lo I love all the stories and the context about Call of Duty and about the business. Um, but I'd, I'd love to talk about your journey a little bit. Um, I think a lot of people could, could you know, learn something from it, could, uh, could be inspired uh, by what you have to share. And I'd love to get into NFL and just your philosophies on life and business. But um, what you just said about these massive historic ambitions, uh, clearly for as exciting as that is, that, that comes with some pressure. And we have a lot of executives 
you know, we have established CEOs and people new to the industry, but, you know, we have people who are, who are in these positions. They face pressure. Uh, there's the type of people listening to this show and someone like yourself, amazing position now, amazing track record, just like on a personal level, how do you deal with pressure? How do you go into a conglomerate like Activision Blizzard, the possibly the biggest gaming franchise in the world, right? Best selling for a decade and a half. It's like, you have to deliver. Like it's, it, it's not, it's cool. You got your title. You know what I mean? I, I see you out here, but like that also comes with Johanna needs to get this work done <laughs> and, 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 to, and help take us to the next level. So like, how do you manage it? How you handle pressure and how you just keep yourself, you know, on track with all the chaos? Yeah. Um, look, I think I'm a big believer in what I would call the, the integrated leader or the holistic leader meaning it would be really easy for me to burn out quick if I didn't have other um, wells from, with, from which I draw. Um, so I've talked about this in prior discussions, but I, I practice yoga every day. It's one example. I mean, I also try and get outside. I also have my kids and my family. I love to travel. But that's my thing. Like That's a boundary where I need to find the time, even if it's 15 minutes or it's an hour and a half, to carve that out. And I usually wake up as early as possible to get it done. And why I say that is it's not, it's so much more than the physical. It's just the mental ability to regain, as they say, and to uh, regulate and to feel more prepared for the day, more balanced, more grounded. It's a moving meditation for me. And so that, that is really useful for me. Um, and also just other communities outside of work. You know, my husband and I are very involved in our church community, for example. And so People don't mess with me on Sundays or at least on Sunday morning if they don't, if, if we can help it, you know what I mean? And, and, and it's important. It's important because it helps me fill the tank again to then one, maintain perspective about the job that I have corporately, but also to bring my best self to that. I think everybody needs some form of that balance. It cannot be, look at how hard I'm working 24 seven, because I guarantee you you're not going to bring your best thinking. You're not going to be able to have your energy um, when you need it most if you're just burning the candle from both ends and it's only work and it's only one dimensional. So that's one answer. I think to your point on pressure, you're exactly right. I mean, it wasn't lost on me when I was given this incredible opportunity to step into the role of GM, that it also carries these other layers like, oh, here comes this woman doing this. Here comes this black person doing this. Here comes, you know, this young, relatively young executive doing this. Here comes this relative outsider doing this, right? So there's a lot of other pressures, but um, it all comes down to me to relationships. And I mean that strategically. You need to make sure that you're walking in and you have real partners, people above, across, and below you who are there to support you, who are there to educate you, and vice versa, and to create symbiosis right? That we're only going to be as successful as our ability to help each other in the moments that matter and to create safe environments, but also productive environments to make really strategic decisions where it's not about me. You know, if we have an, a, an amazing Q4, is it awesome? And will it be a hugely proud moment for me as an executive? Sure. But it's not about me. It's about Call of Duty. It's about players. It's about, is the community happy? Are they happier than ever before? Are we, are we agile enough as a franchise and as an organization to be able to pivot with community expectations, right? Month on month. And if we can really put that at the forefront, it makes it actually easier to create thriving relationships that are not about like, I need this win for me and the, the resume and the next interview. It's like, no, I'm, we're just, we're here to all play our role. We all have some real value to bring. I think that mentality has helped me a lot, you know, um, so that everybody feels like we're co-authoring this and it's going to be a shared win or it's going to be a shared challenge, whatever the day may bring. I, I love that perspective. What you said about like the holistic or integrated leader uh, reminds me, I've probably referenced it like too many times, but it's really one of my favorite business quotes, Steve Jobs. Um, so when he started next after he got kicked out of Apple, um, there's this great video out there of him, like essentially had a company retreat 
and it's like super in- intimate footage of him with his team and mm-hmm. like you know just you you get to see one of the great minds of you know our time you know exercising like these core business and leadership mm-hmm. um values and the one that always stuck with me was like somebody has to be the keeper and reiterator of the vision um mm. and essentially like you have to let people know and and keep people on track in the sense of these crazy things that we want to do are possible. They're right there. I know right now you got all these emails and stuff going on, but like we are moving in the right direction. And sometimes just maintaining that is important. It is. It's, it's such a great example too, because I think as a vision center setter, which is a, a core part of my role, it actually helps when you do that, right? It's a filtration system. It, it helps the team prioritize, okay, what matters most based on not just where we want to be next week, but where are we going? Like, where is it 12 months from now? Where is it three years from now? So when we talk about long range planning, it's not just because it's part of the job and you're going to present it to the board. It's because to your exact example, it allows us to steer a ship with a long lens, a long-term lens. And when you take that longer term lens, that's when you create values, norms, behaviors, that you bring consistently, no matter what the KPIs may suggest on any given day, right? It's directional, but it's also motivational in its direction. It's inspiring people to sort of level up. I think we've done a really nice job of that as well in the last year or two and say, yes, is Modern Warfare 2 this huge moment for the, the quarter? Yes. But we actually now know as a collective how it fits into a broader, longer term roadmap. And, and therefore our decisions and our, and our strategic uh, dialogue comes with a broader context, which I think has really helped us. Something else that you said, um, just talking about like preserving that space for yourself. Um, I always, I love stuff like that because like it's deeper. It's, it's yes, I love yoga on its own terms. It's great. But like, even if you want to be like, shrewd business person everything is about but it's like that stuff is literally important to yes. be able to function from a business standpoint yes. um i i i've seen people say you know like like being busy we all know i've probably been you've probably been that person i'm so busy all these things going on and like it's not really a flex it, it means like you could probably improve your time management mm-hmm. a little bit mm-hmm. <laughs> um 100%. you know yeah 100%. but um well, so with all of that, uh, this is sort of stemming from what you said about yoga. And you have, like, a really diverse background. I mean, so so you have yoga now, but I know you play basketball, soccer, track and field, mm-hmm. softball. You did martial arts. Um, how are, like, these other do, – do you have time or do you still, like – like, what's your relationship to these other sports? Because you play, like, seemingly every one, uh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah. know, growing up. And I burned out as a result. So for all the parents out there, there is such a thing as too many sports. But um, but no, I think, look, I think uh, I used to talk about this as well in my role at the NFL. I am a huge believer in the power of sport, however we define that. It, individual sports, team sports, I like watching sports. It cultivates, again, behaviors and norms and tenacity and discipline and all the things, right, that are so transferable to great work in the corporate system or to great work in any business that we define for ourselves because it's training. It's just training for how do you win? What does success really feel like? How do you lose well? How do you partner with others well? Where's the humility? Um, And how do you create, again, that consistent return to form to continually improve? And so much of that I draw from, even though I don't actively play, you know, in soccer scrimmages anymore and whatnot. I'm excited because I'm going to be coaching my kids uh, sports every now and then. And that's awesome, you know, but that's more just for fun. Uh, I would say, again, I, I can't think of a time, both from a performing arts perspective, but also as an athlete, where I'm not drawing from the same principles of performing well, of, you know, working with and through others and having a servant leader mind, mindset, but also when the weather isn't pretty or when no one is looking, what discipline are you bringing to your craft just for the sake of getting better, just for the sake of trying to outdo yourself? I'm drawing from that well all the time. And so I think it was just such a good uh, way to start off 
Um, and it, it, it's something that I, I really uh, I value and I, I value in others as well. So you talk about how sport, um, you know, all these things that you can learn from and you can apply throughout your life, throughout your career. What about this like 12 years at the NFL, um, you know, the most popular sport and league in the country. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we, we don't, we don't have to say we, but, but it's interesting just because like front office sports, uh, we're, we're, we're covering the viewership every week. We're looking at the media rights and it's just like unprecedented. It like, it's, it's like insane. I'm like these, you know, 20 million people casually watching on, on a, on a Monday night or just, it, it runs our country. I think there was a stat like, um, like 45 of the 50 most viewed telecasts yes. in 2021 were NFL games yes. and stuff like that. So, so you spent 12 years at this illustrious organization, um, you know, some, some challenges, but, but you know, a lot and a lot of wins. I'm sure, you know, you played a hand in, in many of them. But but what was your time like there? And also, like, what did you learn that you carried at Activision Blizzard and working on Call of Duty? Yeah, uh, amazing training ground. I, I honestly can't think of a better one in many respects because of the ability to get exposure to big business, big brand management, community development, uh, major communication strategy. I just could go on and on. And that's, a, you know, goes beyond just the product on the field and player relations and, and all these other things that go into it. So to be able to have more than a decade of exposure to how revenue gets generated, how you barter major mega billion dollar deals um, and how the business really flows throughout and also then have the ability to tap into driving marketing strategy and fan development and brand development and initiatives and events. I mean, it's just, I think about it all the time. It's just such appreciation because somebody was paying me to learn like that, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and when you, when you think about it that way, yeah, it was hard work, but the ability to just learn at such a clip um, it's just tremendous. And I think it is for anybody who gets the opportunity to, to work at any part of the league or any of the big leagues, frankly. What I took from that, um, I'll say just from a career perspective, because I think it's important. There's also that fork in the road that we often face, I think, especially when we're maybe culminating a first chapter of our careers about like, do I stay or do I go? You know, do I just continue to deepen my exposure in this field or do I leverage it? Do I apply it somewhere else and take the risks associated with leaving the nest? I found that fork on the road for me four years ago when Activision Blizzard called and said, hey, we love what you're doing. We're recruiting all these, you know, executives from traditional sports to help us design a very similar methodology for gaming IP, right? And to take Call of Duty and franchise it not dissimilar to the NFL and the NBA and whatnot. So there's an obvious link there because I can say, well, I've, I've got all this. I know how this one works. I've got this new opportunity that, as we talked about at the beginning of our discussion, that when you run the numbers is so well positioned for scale, but is still in hyper growth mode. I can have immediate impact walking in the door. I like that. That's good. The underbelly of the fork of the road is I have no idea if this is going to work. I could be going into something that has no interest in me again as an outsider or has no interest in pivoting the way that I think it might, it might, it might want to pivot. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad every day that I took that risk, but it was a risk. Um, and thank God I did. It's just been such a transformational opportunity. And, and here's the irony. What I thought at the time was this big zag and I'm sort of leaving behind this illustrious career to your point. Within weeks, I mean, they ended up being just a part of the, the same industry. Now it's the same industry, right? It's it's competitive entertainment. And whether you're watching it on Sunday Night Football on NBC or whether you're watching it on YouTube and you're checking in Overwatch League or, or what have you, we're all kind of thinking and asking similar questions. How do you develop the best fans of the world? How do you get them to be a, a season ticket holder? How do you drive merchandise? How do you drive media rights? I mean, it's all the same in many, many ways. And especially at Activision Absolutely. Blizzard, where we've we franchised these these teams in a city-based way. So um, it's felt only like an expansion of my career at the NFL, but in all these 
ways that are inherently exciting to me, just more global, um, more fast paced, um, more community driven in many ways. And I, I couldn't ask for more. Well, with all that experience, you also went to school at Harvard. Um, you know, that's, that's a nice one to have on the resume. Like, oh, every, every Harvard person I know is so humble. They're like, mm. yeah, I went to school in Cambridge, <laughs> that's you right. know, what? or Boston. That like, always gives it away. Yeah. Oh my God. Um, love, love you all. But, but, you know, Harvard to NFL to Activision Blizzard. Um, what has been your perspective and almost just like the thing you want to say about diversity like you are a woman you're a black woman and all of those spaces you know just they're they're probably although growing not necessarily mm -hmm. the most diverse like we you know these institutions these you know universities they're trying to improve in that regard. We certainly know the NFL is and, and even game. I look at my, my daughter who's just like faithfully on Animal Crossing and stuff. And I'm like, man, I can't believe when we were her age, it was like, girls don't do this, whatever. She's on her Switch heavy, you know, totally. she's on her Xbox heavy. And um, so I say all that to just say like between <laughs> – like football, gaming, and and then definitely like as black people when it comes to these universities, um, just like what have you learned? And I and I guess that's why I say like, what do you want to say? Because like there's a lot of talking points that we've all heard. I'm like mm -hmm. coming from your perspective, Johanna. What do you want to say about mm -hmm. being a black woman in these spaces and in business in general? Yeah, look, I think it goes back to we're representing so much more than just what's on the business card. And it's, it's such a motivation for me to succeed with a capital S because I want to be able to prove writ large that anybody, no matter your background, no matter how you look, no matter how you identify, this is possible success at the biggest and, and boldest levels of corporate America or corporate anything um, is possible. And it's possible when great people drive inclusive spaces to get really cool things done together. Cannot do it alone, but we certainly can do it together. And if everybody's, you know, really incentivized to support each other in that way, it's just such a, it's, it's an empowering story that, your daughter can say like, oh, cool, she's doing it. Well, I'm going to be better than her. That's what I want. I want like 35 other me's at the table yes. being like, yeah, you're cool and all, but I'm going to take it to the next level, right? That's the whole, that's the gig to me. But you need to be, you know, I, I feel honored to at least maybe be in the chair to break down those misconceptions or to inspire other women or minorities or underrepresented groups to say, man, if she can do it. I certainly can do it and change the, the dialogue around that. Um, so that's huge. And, and, and it goes a long way. And then back to anecdotes and storytelling, I'll say to you, you know, I don't think I've, I've shared it before in an interview, but you know, a, a handful of the most inspiring notes that I get sometimes like on, from people on LinkedIn that I've, I've never met or whatever is when they drop into the DMS and it will be like a, a young black woman who's just like i'm just inspired by like the fact that you are in these spaces doing what you're doing motivates me to say that i can i'm like done i've done it that's the you know that those are the things that fulfill me and obviously you know it also takes work um it takes representation i'm an active member you know i'm the uh, executive uh champion and, and sponsor of our black employee network here at activision blizzard king um, and we talk about it, you know, you can't be what you can't see. And so also making sure that I'm a lead voice and a lead champion for, um, other black people at the company, um, and other uh, underrepresented minorities at the company is as important a part of my job and my role to drive culture and change and representation and recruitment as anything that I'm doing on the commercial side. Um, it's not enough for me to just say like, wow, she's a great business leader. I've got to be with, be and with and for my people actively too, right? And those working together, I think, can really open doors at a, a faster clip. So that's my answer. Well, it was a wonderful one. Um, I I also 
you know, I love what you've referenced throughout the conversation. I think even a bit in, in what you said just now is like the inherent challenges that that come with business, pretty much any business that you're in, it's half it's half defined by the challenges by like like one thing I even try to maintain at FOS like editors by nature, we're going to find mistakes. Like, like that's what we're doing. And so much of business is always about, well, like, what are we doing wrong and how can we do it better? And you're always, you know, you know how it goes. Like yep. we, we know how this stuff goes. And I think, you know, you always have to like maintain your culture and be able to say to people, look, it's not just about nitpicking your mistakes. It's actually because all this great stuff, we're trying to just like make that the standard. Right. right. Um, but challenges is like I said, just an inherent part of of rising to a position like yours, and even like from entry level on. Um, you've been at NFL, which over the course of that decade had all sorts of challenges. You know, we don't have to get specific in terms of Activision Blizzard, but like you know, obviously in the news, there's been you know the the points about some of the the culture issues, and I wonder just how you what what part do you do to you know keep people focused keep people inspired mm -hmm. you know in the midst of difficult moments and difficult situations that's mm -hmm. the reality and, and i just love like all your advice your business your career advice and i think that's something that like we can't ignore and i think you you would have a great perspective mm -hmm. on it so um you know, wondering what you think in that regard. Yeah, this goes back to this word proximity to me, to be honest, because we often also have choices as peers, as colleagues, as people to like run into the fire or run away from it. You know what I mean? It doesn't mean you always have to be a firefighter. That's not my point. But there are these moments in time where you can sense if I'm struggling, I can only imagine how other people across the organization might be struggling. And where are the forums for dialogue? Where are the forums for like, hey, let's just go get lunch and like be people. Let's just get people. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe the power that that has had for me to be able to say in times of crisis or in times of hardship or just in times of stress to say, we're not going to talk about work. I'm coming out. I just want to tell me about your job. Like, who are you? How long have you been here? Awesome. Here's me. Um, and, and really flatten hierarchy and really just gather as colleagues and people to create a space of camaraderie and People walk away from those moments healed, but they also feel seen. They feel like it's not just I'm being used for some you know, commercial purpose and everything else is, is by the wayside that I have to go deal with elsewhere. Um, and so I try to bring that in. I think my one-on-ones, whether it's with my own reports or with, um, you know, I'm a formal mentor, so I, I mentor a ton of people at the organization. Um, or again, just showing up more ad hoc in moments, whether it's a leadership offsite where, um, where I say, we're not going to talk about business for the next couple of days. We're going to talk about like what we've been through for the last two years. Let's talk pandemic. Let's talk about parenthood. Let's talk about, you know, vulnerability. Let's just, let's go there um, back to holistic leadership. 10 times out of 10 that I can recall where we've had those more intimate human to human spaces for dialogue, people walk away feeling more, motivated, feeling re-energized to get back into the work and feel more bonded as a result, right? So that would be my response to that. Um, and to continually run into the fire or run into the stress without a KPI agenda, right? And I just, love that. Yeah, just like find the, find the humanity in it. I, I think that's so important. It's like, like, can we be people? Mm -hmm. And I, and I think, and I always try to separate this one, I think on its own terms, it's just good to just connect as people. Yep. But I think everyone gets like super caught up in work and we're all so busy and everything. And you have to remember like this, yes, it's good for the personal thing, but it also has a business purpose. Correct. Like we're going to get better work done Correct. by people feeling seen, feeling heard and having a strong culture. So um definitely love that perspective this is sort of like out of nowhere but i'm a big music person i know you play violin um do you still play any instruments and also just like what what since you grew up playing music like mm -hmm. like what music do you like i, I ask so many people this because it's like hard for me not to but like what do you think of the space what are you streaming what's on mm -hmm. your apple music or spotify mm -hmm. like 
you know, what, what are you listening to when you're mm -hmm. firing through all those emails? Yeah, I love it. So I'm a vocalist. I, I sing at my church and um, I started that when I was at, was at Harvard pretty seriously. Um, I, I always say I play violin, but I am not a violinist and there is a difference. <laughs> But I loved it. But I, you know, music is my medium. I love it. And there's a ton of musicians at Activision Blizzard, by the way, fun fact. And I, I always love that too. So a lot of creative people. Um, what's on my Spotify? It's so funny. I'm having this like nostalgic. So I listen to everything. I mean, classical, acapella, hip hop, Radiohead, you know, like you pick it. I'm, I'm all across the board. I love, I, I bet our um, discographies or, or library is like putting on shuffle and it's going to play me Britney Spears, <laughs> then Wu-Tang, yes. then Radiohead, then classical, then country, yes. then back to like Illmatic. Like, and I just think that's the way to approach it. Like I even sometimes say there's two types of music. It's good music and bad music. Amen. And honestly, sometimes I even like bad music for, for what it challenges or proposes Amen. in its own way. But Amen. but what's on the playlist? Yeah, what's so the there's, there's a ton of CCM, like contemporary Christian music, because, you know, it's my gig and I love it. But there's, I just got out of the car and I was listening to Mama's Guns, one of my, uh, you know, Eric Badu and one of oh. my favorites and D'Angelo. I'm in, I, I got back into, in the last month, like my Neo Soul it's just it's crazy right now um and i hadn't been there for a while and i can't get out but i couldn't be happier so you know a lot of lauren a lot of d'angelo a lot of a lot of the, the hitters right now but oh, your yeah. your playlist range is the same as mine it just kind of depends on the day and the mood yeah i do i do love that era mama's gun um like voodoo Badu, and, like, yeah. well and baduism though was so important for me because like you know, my mom was playing that in the minivan in 97. Mm. <laughs> and, and, and that was like one of the first times where I feel like I started to define my own taste. Yes. You know what I mean? I knew every word in next lifetime at yes. like seven or whatever. Uh, but such a, such a good era in music. So much, so much, you know, wonderful songwriting and talent. Like, yeah. you know, it's still, it's miseducation. Lauren exactly. Hill still blows my mind. Blows I just had a, I just, I just had a um a velvet rope, Janet Jackson. Yeah. Oh, see now you're gonna have me go back and listen to Janet now. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Yeah, the the nostalgia is real. Um, you know, I think I think that's that's sometimes that's part of what's driving modern warfare too. Like, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You're you're bringing something new to the table, but I've seen I've seen people just post like a screenshot of of War modern warfare too. Yes. Um, or, or the original Modern Warfare and just no context. They're just like, remember this? Yes. Nobody has to say COD or anything. It's just like people remember some of their best times and yes. experiences in entertainment stem from this franchise. Yes, 100%. And it's such a good link back because it's real. And it goes back to, you know, when people um, identify and create community around these seminal seminal moments in entertainment, be they gaming franchises, be they music, albums, what have you, it stays with you on such a deep level, right? And so for us to be in a position to build on that, it's really just a, a question of what do you preserve? You know, you don't leave that magic, but how do you innovate to your point and really create even new conversations around it? So we're excited, we're excited. Yeah, well, it's been such a wonderful conversation. I feel like we could do one of those uh, like three hour podcasts, but I yes. won't put you through that today. <laughs> um, I, I do have a couple of things I want to wrap up with. Uh, one, holistic, one of the buzzwords of this conversation. I do use that word a lot, though, because I think that's like the way to think. A lot of times you have to see the big picture, um, but looking bigger picture than Call of Duty, than even Activision Blizzard, like where do you think the industry is going uh, where do you think this generation is going? We're a couple. We're a couple years into, uh, you know, the new consoles, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you might be privy to like some technology mm -hmm. developments that that not everyone is is hip to. And you know, as someone who like you, I got my start Sega Genesis, PlayStation One, PlayStation mm -hmm. Two, Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty, Xbox One. You know, all of this stuff we're on now. I think that we're, although the graphics are beautiful, we're a little bit beyond like the graphical jump that happened with some previous generations. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is performance, move mm -hmm. frame rates online, and just like 
what do you think the next five, 10 years is going to look like in this space? It's so hard to predict, but I say that with great anticipation because the rate of innovation is moving at such a clip now. And the competition is so fierce that it's actually driving sort of new tech in, in, in new dimensions really fast. So it'll be hard to know. I will say though, and it's a lot back to our long range plans and chasing, you know, mega trends, mobile gaming. I mean, if you don't have a mobile strategy right now, Mm. And it doesn't mean you do away with anything. I mean, what, what the next gen of PC will look like, what the next gen of console, like everyone's going to continue to drive a new new medium. But mobile is in many ways the next big, I'd say, near-term growth engine for gaming. And not dissimilar to what being able to activate social media in a direct-to-consumer way on a handheld has done for how we all identify and gather and connect. I think the same holds true for um, the way in which uh, gaming publishers and hardware and software tech companies are gonna need to optimize for gaming in my in the palm of my hand, right? And, and so I'm really excited about that. And I'm excited because Activision Blizzard has a you know, great um, pulse on that and Call of Duty is a great pulse on that. It's exactly why we're bringing Warzone to mobile, but it's the start of a multi-year trajectory that we know we need to um, be a leader in. Uh, we don't wanna be chasing trends there, right? So I, at minimum, I, I think that's a huge part of it. What do you think of consolidation? Like I... I'm not going to, I'm look, I'm a journalist. I want to be like, tell me everything about the Microsoft <laughs> acquisition. I, got, I, I do, got nothing I do. to say. I got nothing to say. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Look, it, you, I, I'm not trying to impact stock prices and, mm-hmm. and have things all over the place. Like I already know you're a public company. I know how it goes, but, but um, I find it very fascinating. It's not even about trying to get the quote from you. I've been, an avid gamer for decades now. Um, I love looking at strategy, whether it's a developer or a publisher, mm-hmm. like AB and studios you work with. Um, I love what Microsoft is doing with Game Pass and with the cloud. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, Sony and Nintendo are like hardware leaders. Um, what do you think of consolidation of, of studio acquisitions and just like how these different companies are, are trying to take us into the next iteration of what like the business looks like yeah look it's 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 a great frame because while i can't opine and honestly i you you would think that i'm just giving you the party line i'm not i'm so focused on call of duty right now it's just get this game out make it the best thing ever right and it actually helps because it you can get really distracted with um trying to predict the weather um however I would tell this to my kids right now it's like don't don't just learn how to code and don't just learn how to animate be an um, an MNA like guru right now because I only see more to your point whether it's consolidation or it's more at a publisher specific level you know we brought on a new mobile studio based in Barcelona last year Digital Legends and with them we're able to scale up a lot of mobile capacity that we otherwise didn't have we need people from lawyers to you know uh, m a experts to bankers to, to financiers who understand how an industry in hyper growth mode needs to be able to consider deals value deals negotiate deals and set themselves up for scale right so i i don't know the specifics of how that all uh, lands but I do think content will continue to be king. This goes back to the, the the premium we need to put on talent as an industry. If you have the best and brightest developers, best and brightest you know technological leaders across the world, you're going to be the best position in the best position to deliver consumer experiences that drive demand and drive interest, both at a B two C and B two B level. So it's about people at the end of the day, and it's about creating work environments where people want to get in and get on the train, right? And so um, I think about it that way, and I think it gets back to um, never forget what you're great at and continue to optimize. And so we're great at delivering Call of Duty year on year. Let's make sure we continue to, to level up. And with that will come more interest, 
more demand, better talent, better, more inclusive and diverse conversations about, you know, what does excellence look like into the future? And with audience growth comes more opportunity for, you know, bigger business deals. So we'll see. All right. Well, I feel like that's such a nice frame to, uh, to take this home on. Um, I feel like some of what you just said probably contains answers of this, this last question that I want to ask, but, but I want to ask it specifically and just see, you know, what you like to share as we get out of here. What are your strongest principles when it comes to leadership, when it comes to business? I saw, you know, you referenced this quote, Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, Heschel. I believe mm-hmm. is how. Yeah, exactly. So, mm-hmm. so when I was young, I admired those who were clever. And now that I'm old, I admire those who are kind. Super resonated with me. Um, Cause I think, I think like, look, both of us probably had that ambitious, 20 streak i gotta do it and and that's good i don't um regret that and i think it probably helped each of us get in different positions but i think with some of that there was this at least for me there was like this tension there was i gotta do this i gotta beat this one i gotta get in this position and that's and again that's cool but like man i have learned so much is just like just be a good person right just like just be like kind treat Mm -hmm. people well foster those relationships. So whether it's that you want to expand on or it's anything else you want to, gems you want to drop in here before we dip, but, but what are the principles you really live by that, that, you know, keep you going? Yeah, I love that. I mean, it, it does that, that quote has carried me through so much and I always just come back to it. So I'll, I'll, I'll circle back on that because it is important um, and layered. I'd say the other one that I, I think about a lot is this, this listening, this, this capacity to be a great listener is actually a practice. It's not like, no, nah, I'm a great listener. I, I walked in that meeting, I was a great listener. I'm a great listener. It, it's, it's actually, you're constantly going to be um, tested in that capacity. It's a skill, uh, not dissimilar to yoga. And there's no real end state. It's just constant improvement. And I find that, you know, the principle of listening, uh, really hearing what other people are saying, and sometimes they're saying it non-verbally really being present to what's happening in a room and who, who the players are and um, not just waiting for your opportunity to opine and then get up and, and, and get on to the next thing. There's such power in that as leaders, but also as brands. And this goes back to, you know, as GM, a lot of my focus thematically has been about listening and don't listen to be like, I disagree. We disagree on behalf of apology, but thank you for your opinion. It's like, okay, what's really behind that? What are the insights that we can glean? And let's wrestle with them, right? And the more we're, we're going to uh, harness the power of listening, the better off we're going to be able to be to build trust, to cultivate engagement with our community, to drive better innovation, to drive more insightful decisions. Um, so it's not just at a personal level. I think it can happen at a, at a workplace culture level and then at a, at a brand and consumer level. That's a huge one for me. And really um, uh, prioritizing that as a practice, I think, has has major results if done well. And then the kindness part, you know, as the quote says, it's like you know, exactly as you said, you, you grow up especially as athletes or people who have ambition and hope it's like, I need to be clever. I need to be clever. It's like, you do need to be clever. You need to, you, your content, your craft needs to be really, really on point. You can't just be a kind person. That That's not, that's part of it. But if you don't, you know, um, root it in more than just wins on the board, one, people will see through that. And two, um, it won't last. It won't last. You know, reputation and real relationships that are genuine are born out of humble, kind, again, when no one's looking, uh, rooted in integrity types of, of approaches to one another. And you and I may never work together in the same office or infrastructure, but I'm rooting for you. And, you, and if you know that you can call on people in the industry for support and it's genuine and it's not for any likes or for any shares, or for any compensation at the end of the day, there's such a, a, a power reputationally that comes from that type of kindness. Um, so yeah, those are two huge ones. And I talk about them a lot. You'd be surprised. I, I share that with 
very powerful people. It's very important to me. And I'm not interested in just doing cool stuff if the kindness isn't there. Well, I'm so appreciative of you really taking time out of your busy schedule, launch week, and 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 sharing all this information with us. I think, you know, the type of people you're trying to reach, inspire, I think we'll be able to accomplish that with this. And, and personally, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, it was really fun to learn a lot about you personally. Um, and Call of Duty, I told you, I'm a gamer. I'm about to go hop on that campaign. Let's do I it. Will be on M- I will be on MP. <laughs> <laughs> holler at me for the for the gamer tag I if will. you're trying to get down um and seriously johanna it's been a pleasure likewise thank you so much that's a wrap on another episode of my other passion i want to thank johanna for coming out honestly one of the very best conversations that we have had on this show it was a long conversation too so i don't feel like i really need to wrap it up if you made it through if you listen to the whole thing props to you i'm sure you learned something i know i did I'm going to be back next Wednesday, as always. We really have an amazing lineup of guests to close out the year here, but I'm not going to get too ahead of myself. I'll let you listen and see for yourself in the coming weeks. Also, make sure you're listening to the lead off in the newsroom, other podcasts for front office sports, whether you're looking for you know a quick rundown on the news in the morning or you want to see all of our reporters and writers really go deep on any given subject. Appreciate you listening. Be back soon.